Would people be interested in having a bit of a conversation now and sharing some of their experiences and thoughts around Botox? It's something that many of you are going through. We've already had a question this morning about somebody who is about to perhaps go for start having Botox treatment and not knowing much about it. So I just wanted to open the floor up and, and back, to, back to all of you guys. If anyone would be willing to offer us a comment or share an experience, good and bad, um, around Botox treatment to date. Is anyone brave enough to start us off? There's a, oh, wonderful hands. Fantastic. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Um. Oh, let's look at them. Oh, so the gentleman behind you first, and then I will we'll come to you afterwards. Next. Oh, OK. Hello, um, sorry, hi. Hello, I'm Stephen again. Um, I, I've had Botox, and when I first had it, I was very worried about it. Mm -hmm. I was quite frightened that it would uh, have terrible effects, and uh, I would die of botulinum, and whatever it is, or whatever. I'd be the one person that it didn't work for. Um, I delayed any um, treatment for a little while, and when I finally had it, um, it didn't actually do what I had hoped for me, but um, in fact, it, it gave me a bit of a scare, and I was put off by it. In fact, I tried many treatments for about nine months without Botox, and it was probably nine months badly spent, but I, I did feel I had to go through the exercise of looking at alternatives, including very painful acupuncture in the face and um, various other treatments which um, might be laughable or, but at least were attempted. And um, then I came back to Botox and uh, it does hurt a little, but um, you do get over it. I'm, I'm sure childbirth is far worse. <laughs> um, <for> Ladies. The <laughs> lady. um, who was uh, worried about it, do do it. Um, in the hands of the clinicians that I have had, I've had nothing but, and I have nothing but praise for them. And, uh, Thank you. Kindness and uh, concern, that, that, that's just normal. And uh, the results are superb. Um, I'm, I'm 35 years younger looking. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, I'm serious. It, it really is a wonderful treatment. My eyesight is fully restored. I, I have every confidence in most things, except for walking which uh, I'm very glad to hear somebody else's um, approach to that, which was to uh, press hard on their tongue um, so that their eyes don't close when they walk. Uh, is that correct? Did I get that right? Yeah. Anyway, I'm thank handing you, back thank now. Thank you. We're going to uh, thank you very much. And then that was uh, really nice to hear somebody who was concerned about Botox, was perhaps put off in the beginning and actually has come back and, and, and is having a really positive experience with it. So that's really good. We're going to ask people to kind of shout a little bit into the mic because the, the sound is sort of getting lost a little bit in this room. Um, Richard, there's a lady there in the purple jacket. Um, if, yep. Um, he'd like to share a comment with us. No, uh, Richard, in the middle here. Oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> thank you. Hi. 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 Thank you. Um, I suppose the point I wanted to make was that, and I'm sure other people have this experience as well, is that um, it seems to take some time to um, find the treatment regime that suits you. And I think that's one of the things that I wasn't really prepared for, that I kind of expected and when I started treatment I'm not sure that it was clear to me that actually I, I would experience some benefit but that, that it would be a kind of bit of an ongoing trial for a while to actually get into a more settled treatment regime and so for a prolonged period I found that the fact that I was very up and down and my condition was still quite erratic even with the treatment it was quite difficult to cope with you know on a mental level um and did and you have access to counseling support was well, that offered fortunately well it was but actually it was only offered to me at the point where i think you know i probably after about 18 months was sort of in the in my regular clinic you know almost on the verge of tears and saying look you know how i don't know can I expect to get any better than this? And at that point, it was obviously clear that I wasn't coping. Um, and that was the first time I was aware that I could access counselling here. Um, whether in other NHS units, it would even have the um, resources to offer counselling, I don't know. But luckily, more fields do. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, it was really that, as I said, that issue about the fact that I just wasn't prepared for it to be the beginning of a process and actually that even when you're in a stable period you still have ups and downs 
And how did, um, can I ask how, how you're feeling now? Would you mind sharing that with us um, a little well, bit further down the line? Yeah, I mean, I've been on a... I, I, my dose of Botox was increased um, probably about 15 months ago, you know, just over a year, year to a year and a half ago, which has been very beneficial for me. But then when I had treatment earlier in the summer, my usual treatment, I had a period of four weeks where I had no um, benefit at all afterwards and actually went downhill, which I'd never experienced. Um, and it was almost as if I had a delayed reaction and that the treatment, I didn't actually start to feel the benefit until about three to four weeks after I'd had the treatment <clears throat> and then entered that stable period again. And that was, that was a new experience for me. So, again, having had a period of stability, I was suddenly plunged back into a, um, an experience where suddenly it was almost as if, well, I was frightened that I'd become immune. I thought I'd developed an immunity because I just had my regular treatment and then didn't feel any benefit at all and just got worse for another okay. three weeks. So. Dan, I'm just wondering whether then perhaps you could, do you have, could make a comment about, you know, or you refer to one of your colleagues around, this idea that perhaps it's not a one, it, it can be a bit of a equilibrium process with Botox. Yeah, this is a, this is a very key point, and I think every patient who, should, who starts treatment um, is counselled and told that it's a process of it's not trial and error, but it's more process of refinement. It's about trying to work out what kind of dose works for you best, and that process can take quite a while. And obviously, because you're having injections at different times, and there is a degree of unpredictability that is inherent in the process. It's not like taking a tablet with a defined dose that will work in a particular kind of way. It's very dependent on location, and sometimes even millimeters of difference can make a difference. So it is difficult, but often, and usually, we do manage to work out a regime that's stable and that can work for you. But that is something that we do hear a lot from our patients. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's, you know, this is why your sharing of these kind of very detailed experiences is so important because everyone is having an individualised experience. I mean, it's really important we capture those. Dan, how are we doing for time? A little bit. Yeah, we've got some time. Wonderful. Uh, there's a lady down here with the grey, white and pink top. Karen's running with the microphone to your right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, hi. I'd just like to say that I've had the same experience as the lady who spoke just then. I had my Botox injections for about eight years and then I suddenly found I wasn't having the same effectiveness afterwards. And my husband was the one who said, come on, you've got to go and say something to the consultant. If it's not working, do something about it. There's probably something else. And of course, I came back and mm -hmm. I spoke to Dan who said, well, we've got a, a trial type of Botox coming. Would you be willing to try that? So I now am on something called Neuroblock and we've worked out the dose which works for me. And it isn't as long lasting apparently, but it's more effective for me. So I think by talking about people, thinking what's new and what's coming up, it probably is eventually possible to get the right dose for you. Thank um, you. Could I just add one more thing? Sure, someone absolutely. This, someone this morning said, what, did the, what are the injections like? Mm -hmm. And the person told the, um, the person replying said, oh, it's quite painful. Now, I don't like pain, <laughs> but actually I would say it's, no one does. it's unpleasant. It's not nice, but it's, I don't think it's painful. So please don't not have it if you're worried about the pain. Thank you. And I think that's a really, really key point there. Work with your consultants, work with your physicians, tell them how you're feeling because they don't know if you suffer. If you suffer in silence, they can't make changes. They can't improve. And that really is what we're trying to get to the crux of today. This idea of being involved and, and taking some ownership and, and, and helping us to do things better. Yes, there's a lady at the back row there. Hi. Oh, hi. Yes. Thank you. Um, I agree with the lady that just has spoken. Um, it's uncomfortable. Um, I personally have found it not that painful, although I know other people here have. Um, I think it's very important where it's put and who does it. Obviously, the amount that goes in. I've been having Botox, I suppose, now over a period of almost two years. I've had five different people um, inject me, uh, some slightly more successful than others. Normally, I think the most I've had benefit is actually two weeks, unfortunately, but it has made the difference between 
being able to drive, which I haven't driven for two and a half years. And like other people have mentioned, walking is extremely difficult or watching television or reading. And I actually live on my own. And um, today is the first day that I've actually spoken to like-minded people that have the same as me. And it's been incredibly interesting Good. to hear right. what they've had to say. It gives me a lot of reassurance. And hopefully I will be in touch with some of these people because personally, from my own, I live on my own. And I don't feel as though I've had the support from my friends. They don't understand it. I think they think I'm pain in the backside. Um, but there are many days that I don't leave the house. I don't speak to anybody. I just look at the walls. I can't really entertain myself. And it is incredibly depressing. Um, but I'd like to be forever optimistic. And uh, I, too, will be trying, possibly in the, in the new year, a different type of Botox. Because it, might, it was suggested that it might be that I've become immune to the other Botox, because it only works for two weeks. But I recommend anybody who's thinking of having it done, I, I recommend it, because for a lot of people, it's worked for a lot longer, and it's been very good, and it's changed their lives. Thank you. I think probably an experience that's echoed by a number of people here. Um, I'd like to bring the microphones to the front, because we're missing somebody. This lady here in yellow um, has been had a hand up for a while. Uh -huh. this lady this lady, yep, that lady behind you, Richard. Um, on my treatment um, it wasn't really working and then they started to up how much Botox I was getting which now um, about three weeks in I get blurred vision and double vision and that lasts for a couple of weeks so it's really hard because um, to have more Botox helps me in the long run sure. a bit, but in the short term, for a couple of weeks, um, I get terribly blurred vision and double vision. And I'm not sure whether if that's something to do with if they miss an area when they're injecting that causes it to go somewhere different or it's just something peculiar to me. Okay, um, I think I, I've got a couple more questions, but I think it's a really good point, and I would urge you to chat with one of our clinical colleagues because um, it's such a personal experience about perhaps what that means for you, Richard. This lady in the front here with the car, with her, in the cardigan, yes, she just wants to make a point. My name's Unity Harvey, and I'm a relative, and of course I'm interested in cause and cure and treatment. I'm interested for my my other brothers and my grandchildren as well. But I look at your research and it has the word medical. And I'm very deaf and I have two mechanical hearing aids, which are fantastic, which enables me to participate in most things. And I'm wondering whether mechanical has been missed out of the Bleparo. Um, technology has got very tiny now. And I look at my brother and I think he needs to be able to open his eyelids and he could see. So is it possible to have something like a heart pacemaker that would enable him? So very, very tiny, but things are getting very tiny. Something that would make his <coughs> eyelids physically open. And um, if there was something like this, maybe in the long term it would stop, it would stop the Botox. And, and even now he has to have drops in his eyes, which means although he can see a lot better, he can walk and aid it now, he finds it very hard to focus on things, which cuts out reading and watching the television screen and things like that. And I think if you could have a mechanical device, his teardrops probably would still be working. So what I'm asking is, has any research been done into any tiny mechanical device that would make the muscles work? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I think, um, to my knowledge, no, Dan. <laughs> um, I think we are. I think the, the. I think the point that we're sort of getting to here is that there's still there's still a way to go, and I think this is an important first step. And actually expressing an interest in um, 
what I, we want other things than medical intervention, we don't necessarily want a drug or a treatment, is an important point to make. And I think Doris is nodding there. That came up, I think, in the priority setting partnerships that drug treatment isn't always what patients are looking for. And we, you know, we hear what you're saying and we take it on board and we'll certainly, you know, do, do feed that into the, into the various feedback ways today so that we can factor that into the priority research um, research priorities that we're putting together at the moment. And there's a question down here, this lady in the front, um, I was hoping we could, Karen? Um, yeah, we'd, I think this is going to have to be the last question. I'm very sorry, but we are running short of time. And But it has been a fantastic discussion. Hello, hi. Hi. Um, just listening to people talking about their experiences, I've been having Botox for over 15 years. And when it started, I thought, I cannot do this for the rest of my life. I can't have this poison put into my body. Fifteen years down the line, I just take it as my routine. You know, I'm off for my jabs. Um, and yes, it does take an awful long time to find the, the right protocol for you. And that does change. And I see the person I consider the best in the world. And we're constantly having to change the dosage. And it... I have various different reactions to it, but one good thing after 15 years is it's slowly beginning to get better. Um, after, you know, I've been to hell and now I think I'm coming back. Um, but it's still a long way down the line, I think. But what a lovely sentiment to end this part of the day on. Thank you, yes. And thank you to everybody who's contributed. It's been a, a really interesting, insightful discussion. Now, I'm just going to hand back to Katie, who is going to touch on just what another way in which you can help continue to feed into this process of informing the research that we do. Thank you. Um, so I really like your question about devices. And I wanted to point out that one of the one of the themes for the Biomedical Research Centre focuses on imaging and devices. It's an active area in medical research. Now, often the clever engineering people aren't working in that area because they haven't thought of that application. So that's exactly why we need to talk to people to come up with these novel ideas. And when we present that to somebody who's doing engineering or something like that, it will fire them with enthusiasm because suddenly they'll see where something they've been working on for a long time has a real impact. So I know there were some people who had their hands up and didn't get a chance to answer and we're very sorry about about that um, we are what we what we want you to do if possible is join a research community within the within your bags um, there is a leaflet that gives you the opportunity to join um, a research community that's managed within the BRC um, it gives us opportunity to contact you to get involved in the future and when we say get involved, it could be in many different ways. Um, when we have clinical trials, we develop patient information sheets. The doctors write those information sheets in language that patients can understand, should understand. When we show those information sheets to some patients, they clearly don't understand. And so now if we're doing trials, we engage with patients and the public and say, is this really lay language? If we've done research, there's no point us doing research and it's staying in the research community. We have to translate that out to support groups so that our research has impact and you can help disseminate the information that we've got. Um, there's huge scope for getting involved. Um, so do join the community. We won't pester you with emails. I think we probably only contact you a couple of times a year, isn't it, Karen? And you have the option to opt out at any time if you're finding it all too much. So <laughs> thank you very much. So we talked about treatment and Botox. So what I'm now sort of wanted to put out um, to people is a couple of those other areas. Um, 
So what about, let's, let's look at maybe isolation support what, and, and some of the feelings there. I wonder if people could, ex could perhaps share some of their experiences with the broader group about support or, or perhaps some of the lack of that they've experienced um, since the diagnosis. Has anyone got a, a comment or a story that they'd like to share around that? Thank you. Hi, um, I'll share one on the, the counselling one, if you like. Um, I live with depression. I was formally diagnosed in 2007. Um, diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis September last year and the blepharospasm in January this year. And my doctor, I asked to be referred to a counsellor to stop the depression coming in with those later diagnoses. Um, I asked after the RA diagnosis. Um, I was given one of these, let's talk, and her first question was, there was a CBT thing, her first question was, let's consider the worst case scenario. So I gave it to her, which was me crippled in a wheelchair with RA. She immediately said, I don't think I'm the right service. Um, I was then referred to a psychiatric um, counselling service with a psychiatrist. The earliest convenience, which was four months later, um, by then I got the blepharospasm diagnosis, I got a letter, the point was for the 25th of February, I got a letter saying they'd put it back a month. So I went to their offices, uh, 1st of February when I got the letter and said, you know, I've survived four months without your input. I've not killed myself, I've not cut myself up. Um, either give me an appointment within a week or discharge me. And they chose to discharge me. Um, my GP secretary then put me in, ch in touch with the psychiatric nurse service at my local GP. And that's how I've got through, is with the local GP psychiatric service, despite living with depression. And I found that the hardest, that here's an appointment four months down the road, oh, we've counselled it to give it to another clinic. And that, yeah, lack of support on that side, I have found the most difficult thing. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And I think we've had the sort of the counter perspective of someone else who, who felt they had access to very good counselling. Um, your sentiment about the GP has also been, again, echoed through, through this survey so far. A number of people have actually really complimented the GP services for actually taking things on board and supporting um, them. So, you know, don't, I, I think the message there is not to necessarily just rely on your specialist centres. Your GP can be a fantastic source of access to help um, and available. Does anyone have anything else to, to add? Oh, yes, hi. One of our uh, clinical colleagues, hello. I don't know if we are allowed to speak. You are allowed to speak, uh, it's a two-way conversation. There is more and more study also now uh, publishing about uh, what we call the non-motor sign following a little bit in parallel of the non-motor signs in Parkinson's disease. And uh, we know now emphasize more about pain in dystonia, about uh, uh, vulnerability for depression, uh, high level of anxiety, uh, even sleep disorders has been, uh, disturbance has been published in dystonia. So uh, despite the fact that uh, Henri Mej uh, talk about a lot of that, but we, a lot of things has been written, but not everything has been read. We say, but a lot of things were forgotten and we are rediscovering the non-motor sign and also as well as doctors who are uh, uh, reading this, uh, this study, learning uh, again, we are relearning that uh, our dystonic patient can be vulnerable mentally and uh, we are more cautious about it. So I think it's both way. A patient should complain if they feel depressed. And us, we are listening, we are more attentive now, I think, uh, than 15 years ago. And um, maybe because I've, between uh, Mej and David Marsden, there was uh, all the dystonia were considered, as Daniel say, as uh, psychological. It was a pendulum, and we push away the psychological because we wanted this patient to be organic and be treated actively. And we push it too far, because the brain is a, is a place for the mind as well as for the motor activity. And now we are relearning and uh, being all uh, organic and being all psychiatric now, being all organic, now we know that there is a balance to find. So, so, so we are relearning as well as doctors. And um, so I patients think, need to tell us. I think that, uh, I, I, I personally find that a very positive message that 
we are all rediscovering and, and that we're learning and this is a process that doctors are going through together with you. It is, it is slow. It is slow. Learning, learning takes time. Um, but I think you know, what's so wonderful about today is clearly from, from the clinicians involved in helping to manage this condition, there is a real sentiment here that we want to learn, we want to do better, we want to know more. And I can assure you that is not always the case. Um, so it's really, really positive. And um, thank you for sharing that. Um, so we've got another question. Yep. Sorry, I've already had a go today, but I'll have, I'll have another go if you can all hear me. But um, I, I was surprised, actually. I've never really had much, before I got this condition, I never really had much to do with the NHS, apart from the fact that I, I sort of work um, within the NHS in, in a sort of loose way. But um, as a patient, I didn't have much um, experience with it. And I was really pleasantly surprised um, I'm under the care of Queen's Square, under the neurology hospital there, and I'm under the care of Moorfields. And I've, I've, when I've actually been in my appointments, I've been very, very, um, felt incredibly supported um, when, when I'm actually there in front of um, the, the, the consultant or, or um, the healthcare practitioner who's, who's treating me. Um, where, I, where I have felt very isolated is the very long periods that often happen between those appointments. And you've really got nowhere to go, and 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 um, a lack of sort of, you know, feeling of a lack of support. And I think I think I joined a Facebook group actually, and, and I feel talking to other people, I find that's very helpful. But um, I, I think it's it's very difficult. I think the NHS has got very limited resources. Um, but I think once you're there and you're sat in front of a doctor or a nurse, or um, you know, the the support and the interest that you get, at, you know, in the small amount of time that you've got with them is extremely good. Um, you know, I think they've got a very limited um, armamentarium with which to do, you know, to treat us, um, and that's obviously something that's developing and learning. And 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 um, you know, but I think it's I've, my experiences have been good ones. I think. Thank you. Um, have I got five more minutes, Dan? Couple, two minutes. Two minutes. He's cutting me down now. So I just I think that is a very lovely segue just into that last piece around diagnosis and referral. And I was just wondering. Does anyone, could anyone sort of perhaps comment a little on that and, and some of the infrastructure at the hospitals that perhaps they've, yeah, Richard, choose, choose away. Um, some, perhaps some of what that pathway has looked like for them in terms of diagnosis and, and referral that we can all learn from. Hello, yes, lady with, that lady there with the microphone, hello. I wanted to say something because um, I work very closely with quite a few patients in this room and quite a lot of the, um, topics we've discussed and touch on today I've seen and um, I know what patients experience. Um, and I wanted to say that in terms of psychological support, we are here. Um, we offer that support every time we see patients. But it's interesting to know that patients also need to tap into the resources we have available. So by discussing your cases um, with us, by telling us how you're feeling, we could signpost you to the right people. Um, and I've signposted quite a few of my patients to our counseling service, which is dedicated to supporting them. And not only in the hospital, but they could actually get the numbers of the counselors and they could do that from a remote location because it's quite difficult for patients to be in the hospital at any particular time um, when they're not having a treatment. It's hard enough to come in every, every three months or every um, four months, but even when you're not coming to the hospital, you have that support there that could actually um, tide you over until you see us. In terms of, um, I just wanted to touch on a topic we spoke about um, this morning, surgery. I've seen lots of patients who've had um, surgery for um, blepharospasm, and I could say as one of the persons um, directly involved in treating these patients that all the patients I've seen that have surgery has come back with very um, reduced spasms to the extent in which we have to reduce the dose of treatment. So that was a really interesting conversation. And I was very pleased that the patient who asked the question in terms of how much surgery help, um, that they've sort of recognized that there is a part for surgery. And um, I'm sure Mr. Ezra feels the same, because I see all his patients after surgery. Um, 
I think we're going to have to I'm draw a close pass there. I'm going to pass the microphone over. <laughs> we're going to have to draw a close there. I'd like to thank everyone for contributing and just leave you on the point that I think what's very clear, at least to me, is that communication is going to be absolutely essential in making some of the changes that we've been talking about. Um, so thank you very much for contributing and for putting yourself out there to share your experiences. Thank you.